feel like part of it is I actually feel a little guilty for probing you so much for the last few episodes that I feel like I should direct my probing somewhere else. And I've probed Noah so many times. He's so. probed out. Just he, let me tell hot you, hot dog in a hallway. It's like a exact, exact. <laughs> just what I was gonna say. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm not very happy with this probing analogy anymore. <laughs> Well, since we have Wes here, I kind of have something I want to talk to him about. Wes just got done moving. Can you confirm? Yes, that is accurate. How awful has that been? It could it could have gone better. It could have been a little bit smoother. That is for sure. Um, I'm very glad the last time I moved, I previously had a storage unit and the place I was living. Uh-huh. Got rid of the storage unit. Oh. Threw away a ton of stuff, which oh. uh, always did, feels good. Did you good. do that uh, the thing that I do where you open up the uh, storage and you go, you know, I haven't needed to take this stuff out of a box for a year. Do I really need this? Yes, that combined with hatred of all things and ownership of stuff in general. Mm-hmm. Why do I have all these things? I don't know. Yeah. Apparently I need them, but... Yeah. Ugh. You know, it's interesting, like, how attached to things we become. Yes. And then you go through a purge and you realize you need so much less stuff. When I, when Angela and I separated and I moved out, I, you know, I realized how much stuff I had that I don't really want anymore, and I still find myself doing it. So I have, oh, this, yeah, I have like uh, these cups for the kids, and I replaced one of the kids' cups. Well, just one cup. I replaced one cup. Why didn't I throw out the other one? It's all banged up. It's all gross. So that's why I got another cup. But yeah, for some reason now I have. I hang on. Like we, yeah, we exactly. save things, and I feel like it short circuits your brain a little bit. You know, you're just like, oh no, you have some sort of sentimental attachment, and so you just don't even consider the thought of getting rid of it, even though you know. And then you need that either one. You're like, oh shit, I have to move all these things, and you have to touch it, or you know, with time, sometimes that like wears out, and then suddenly look at it fresh, and you're like, okay, now I hate this. Get out of my life. So you did a big things purge. Yeah, um, I'm still in the progress now. I'm going to try to internalize that a little bit more maybe do like a monthly or or every other Whoa. month thing where you just you know don't have to get rid of anything but mm. prune that and then maybe that can also balance out and that's a good by doing that i also will then not guilt myself if i want to do but you know buy something new as well so you are a week into the move two weeks into the move three weeks yes uh, i think it was last friday and do you have internet yet no oh <laughs> how angry are you right now uh, it's not because i'm sure this is the one thing that was like pretty dialed in right because you got to get internet it's kind of yes. how you do your job yeah it, no exactly i mean thankfully i'm very close to my office now which is which is very oh, nice. nice so i can do that and there's a lot of you know coffee shops or bars in the area that have wi-fi so and there's there's tethering as well but it is it it that's like one of the there's also a ton of stuff i still need to put away or find it's new it's actual permanent home now i'm trying to be a little bit pickier about this one and how i organize it so that's taking longer but the real factor that makes it not really feel like a home yet is the wi-fi mm-hmm. and it makes everything else go slower because i'm used to listening to podcasts or other things just on in the background it's mm-hmm. a it's a missing part mm-hmm. of my life mm-hmm. are you going to do any new hardware setup or any different networking configs in this place you i any- did buy a uh ubiquity uh, AC Pro, whatever, uh, oh. as a new wireless. Because the last one I was using, the landlord left a bunch of stuff that she just she didn't need. One of those was like a mono price uh, wireless AP. So that was around the time I built that uh, my current router, which is a Linux box that runs a systemd and spawn container that does all the you know runs like the firehole firewall thing and runs DNS mask and all those other pieces. Uh, so now I get to pair that with. A nice AP. So uh, I need nice to... Nice upgrade. I've configured it, but I need to build like the permanent container that's going to run the Ubiquity uh, software really? Java thing. Really? Really? When you say build the, the... You mean, is it going to be another systemd end spawn container? Yeah, I think so. You're liking that? Yeah, it'll be just a, an Ubuntu 16 cloud image probably and just running their jar and... Yeah. So this, this if I'm... Am I right in saying this was sort of your experimentation with systemd's containers? Yeah. It's... I think if I were to do it again, I would consider... Going using an Ubuntu base and using LexD. Yeah, I was it's wondering just, about that. It's a little more approachable in terms of they've got a lot of images made for them and the way that they for LexD. Yeah, uh, you know, they, they, they come from a lot of stuff and there's just like a little bit richer of a management API kind of around it. Um, you can tell it's maybe designed more for enterprise use or, sc- or scaled use. That said, System D Spawn exposes a lot of nice things for you. It can pull right from Docker files. It's super easy to get started, and it's easier to run on like an Arch base, which I also enjoy. Oh, so, yeah. so I'm not. I haven't really decided well, it's there. Really, just built right in. It's yeah, like it's, it is. It's, yeah, it's exactly. Just like the definition. I of already it. have it. You know what might be? You know what I I have often found when I'm using the some of the tools by Canonical that they create that kind of reproduce the functionality of other tools so like uh, lx lxd and 
their tools around that, or even snap packages to a degree. Mm-hmm. There's there's mm-hmm. other solutions out there, but one of the things that Canonical does that I didn't know about until kind of recently was as part of building the tool, they actually have usability experts come in to look at how this is formatted as a command or a syntax. Oh, wow. How, you, how the structure of the commands are written out, and they have, they have usability people that help them. That can go a long way. It, so it could be why you find yourself slightly more pulled. One yeah, of the definitely. reasons in that direction is because that's one of the projects that I think that's happened with. Yeah. I, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, the, there's pluses and minuses to both. I really like that systemd and spawn kind of leaves more things to you. There's a lot of pieces you can tie together pretty mm. automatedly, especially if you're using systemd networkd, but you oh, have really? to learn like a little like, bit more, like, you know, setting like the, up a bridge and then auto ah. make, you know, so you can have private networking in each yeah. container. Oh. Lexd does that as well, but they have like their own service that they run that mm-hmm. then creates a bridge. So it's a little bit more hodgepodgey. Well, I, systemd again, it's all right. If you've got, if you got all of it's components. kind of it's kind of both of those. Like so, so the systemd integration, it's better, right? The systemd systemd integration just makes sense, uh, but none of it's default. So you have to go, you know, most distros aren't even necessarily using systemd networkd yet, uh, unless you enable. It. So you have to go set all that up. Mm-hmm. Versus lexd, you just install their app. You know, on a bunch of sixteen now, you can do sudo apt install cfs lxd and then you're running zfs containers it's mm-hmm. just that easy mm-hmm. um so so it's really nice from the casual admins perspective you know you can show up you know you can just do some easy commands to really see what's happening system d i think it's easier to understand all what's going on under the cover so if you're interested in it it might be a better place to start playing with uh but as you know when you come back to it then you're like oh wait what was this and where does that image that's what live? i was just wondering because you're actually using lxd in in production right so your I day-to-day used... job or oh not anymore uh, I've been using it. We're using it in uh, test right now, uh, so oh, we use okay. it to to spin up test VMs. Yeah. Ah, uh, but okay. So you're still probably interfacing more with LXD than you are. So I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And between the two of them, I suppose. Does anybody care? Does anybody care about containers? I'm I don't trying know. to. I'm trying to get a feel. Actually, I would like to know wherever you're listening to this. Give us feedback. You can go to the contact page at jupiterbroadcasting.com/slash/contact or in the YouTube comments or at Chris Les me because. There are a few things in Linux that I'm really excited about right now, but I, I don't talk a lot about yeah. it because I feel like people's eyes glaze over when I talk about containers. And it's because there's so much hype there and so business hype. jargon around it that just makes you want to puke that I think people are tuning out to what is actually turning out to be a awesome universal software delivery platform, for better or for worse, and Linux is a key player in it. And what that means is there is there is there is stuff out there in containers that will change your life. It'll make your life so much easier. It like you have you wanted automated television downloading and sorting and hosting? Like there's containers out there that are gonna do that for you. Do you do you, do you wanna have a, a, a complete home automation that's all on your land, encrypted and doesn't send any information to third parties? There's containers out there already set up and ready to go for you. Are they all perfect? No. But that's kind of part of what's fun about it for me is like going through them and seeing how some are put together versus mm-hmm. others and seeing what's good ideas and bad ideas. I find all of it to be fascinating. And you can just throw it away, right? If you're like, yep. nope, this sucks. Get yeah. out of here. Yeah, I find it all to be really interesting. Like one of the biggest, coolest, most aggressive areas of open source right now. What do you think? You will you you represent somebody who's probably not super fired up about containers. What do you think? From everything that I hear about containers, uh, people just say, just use Docker and let, let everything else work as it may. Yeah. They don't really dig too deep into what's on the back end. Yeah. Hmm. But I feel like there's so much good stuff out there in containers and stuff and ways to deploy them and manage them that are fun to screw around with. I get excited from the, like, uh, just like the Linux user perspective, too, because VMs always felt so heavy to Mm -hmm. me and far away, and you're running this whole other OS. And here you get some of the same primitives and the same, you know, sandboxing and splitting um, and kind of fun. You get to play with networking. You get to play with namespaces and mounts and all that. But it's you all just stay right in Linux. There's yeah, no weirdness. St- exactly, and you still have that risk-free. Like if this all goes south, I just blow this thing away, yeah. and my system's hit fine. Control D a few times, and then you're, mm-hmm. you're done. Yeah. It's for me a, such a cool way to play with a bunch of open source projects that would require I set up nginx and require yeah. I set up all these extra things that I could do and have done. But honestly, if I'm just playing, like I'm just my version of playing on a computer is is really not games anymore. It's usually configuring my Linux desktop. Or messing around with software yeah, exactly. that runs on Linux and containers just it's just like it's a playland for me. It's a it's a great playland, and uh, I love the fact that if I really screw something up, 
I just delete it. See, so it's become for me like anytime I'm going to evaluate some new software that I'm like, I don't know what this installs or the mm-hmm. dependencies. Boom. You know, I have like a base 16 container image. Mm-hmm. I just clone up a new one, fire it up, install the stuff, play with it. If I like it, it gets installed in the real one. And otherwise it disappears. Well, this is obviously a great spot to mention DigitalOcean because I was just going to say one of the things I use containers for is if I have an application that needs a ton of CPU for a little bit, I just spin up a DigitalOcean droplet. I put the container on there. I let it run for a couple of hours, and then I shut the whole thing down. DigitalOcean.com. It's an easy way to spin up SSD-based systems on their great infrastructure. I love this droplet system that they have because it it makes it all click for you. Imagine DigitalOcean is a giant, vast ocean, and you can place a droplet anywhere in their ocean. Sounds crazy, but it's true, and they have a fantastic dashboard, easy-to-use API, and a brand-new cloud firewall. I know this sounds crazy, right? But here's where it makes sense. By using DigitalOcean's new built-in cloud firewall, you'll have a central location to define access rules and apply them to all of your droplets. And here is my favorite part about this new feature. Now, when they roll out features, do they nail this stuff. They enforce your firewall rules at their network layer, so unauthorized traffic will never even reach your droplet. Hey, yo. That is slick. You combine that with their alerting and monitoring. You combine that with the CDN system they have, block storage where you can attach block devices up to 16 terabytes, with high memory systems that are just nuts. Or itsy bitsy systems that just get a job done for $5 a month. Go to DigitalOcean.com, just use our promo code, here's the thing, all one word, smush it together, you create the account, you apply that to your account, you get the $10 credit, and then you go crazy. DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code, here's the thing, and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring User Air. My new place, uh, it's... So it's not as nice as the old place, like the finish inside and, and that, that kind of thing, because the old place was a pretty new building, it was like 2007. So um, this place is cheaper. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. And the, the old place was kind of more space than I needed. It was like a lot of sure, space. And, sure. Yeah, just it's kinda, not just you. Yeah. Uh, I got dogs and a lady. Um, although she has been traveling a bunch for family, so she's not there all that much. She kind of, she she has a go bag and uh, a, her work has a studio nearby, so she... What does she do? Uh, she is an animator, or well, now she's an art director, but uh, works at like an animation company. And she can do that remotely. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's in the office a lot too, but it's kind of a you know like a half and half thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where's family? Are they far away? Uh, no. Well, yes. Some is in Hawaii. Some oh, is really? some is over in Belfair. So she'll spend a bunch of time out there, okay. um, especially now in the summer months. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, the new place is right downtown, literally like a block from Pike Street or from the Pike Place Market. No yeah. way. Got a water <laughs> view. It's oh pretty my sweet. Gosh, I'll have to send yes. some pictures. That sounds really nice. That sounds like primo real estate. Wow, congratulations. That If I was going to live downtown, man, that would be where I'd want to be at, too. It's a weird old building with, like, original windows, and it's, like, tucked into this alley below the market, but it's cool. That's all. How's the parking situation? No parking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are you I'm, doing? Uh, I'm looking. Uber. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of the reasons it's cheaper, right? Like the old building had a, a garage underneath, which was really nice. Uh, so right now I'm parking after eight, between eight and eight. It's free street parking, so I can I can have a car around there. But during the day, it's like a two hour limit. It's it's terrible. Are you doing the sh- car shuffle thing? Like I'm or... doing the car shuffle oh thing right gosh, now. Man. Um, it's not it's not so bad because I don't actually need a car all that often. Uh, work is like five blocks away, so I can walk walk to and from work. Right now, I've been keeping my car up on the hill. Oh, um, and there's a bus line that goes right from downtown up there. That's, that makes it so if you can walk to work, you can grab the bus. So what I'm thinking about is seeing how long I can put up with that during the summer months when it's nice, and then probably in October or n- November I'll pay for a garage. If you're out walking around during the day, because they're not open in the evening, but if you're out during the day, like lo- around lunchtime. Or maybe look it up on Google Maps, um, Planet Java Diner. Oh, okay. Planet Java Diner, downtown Seattle, is uh, run by Angela's folks. Oh, really? I yeah. will definitely look that up. Yeah, so you can tell them, you know, Jupiter Broadcasting sent you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sounds fun. And it's a, it's a nice, like, 50s-style diner, and oh, they've got some I like good diners. Food. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, so you can go in there and say hi to Patty and Curtis. Do they have Wi-Fi? That's the question. You know what? I'm not sure. I'll ask. I can't remember. I I'll can't. report back on this yeah, one. Yeah, I would like to. And you know what? If they don't... 
I think we could make an Name episode and shame out of them. No, what we should do is go down there and do like a pimp oh, my yeah. ride kind of oh, like yeah. internet. That thing. would be a lot of fun. And then yeah. Wes can have a new hipster hangout. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that would really be the goal, right? Get exactly. you good solid connectivity. <laughs> so you got a you got a known place to go to, but also it would be good for their business. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's one thing. Like now that I've moved, I have to kind of do that. Is I had had a couple places that were you know like within like two or three blocks, so I don't have to mm-hmm. walk too far. That I can go if I want to be out of the house and a different atmosphere. I'm trying. I have to find that again now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? Legitimately, sometimes the best solution is to go help a business out and yeah. uh, set up set up their internet, and then you know it's good and you're friendly with them. Sounds like show content. I think it would be at least what, vlog are there, content. Are there other kinds of things like that, like weird one offs that we can we can do? I have always 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 wanted to do Pimp My Ride Linux edition for uh, for businesses. Going to like a small business that's using like XP for like a file server. Yes. You know, these train wrecks that exist throughout the small business, just like... Small business nightmares. Yeah, where they've set up some sort of horrible work group file sharing <laughs> setup <laughs> and like just roll in there and like here's a file server. Maybe it could be FreeNAS. Maybe it's Open Media Vault or whatever. Like here's a here's a Linux desktop and maybe set them up with like terminal services or something mm-hmm. and just really go in there and like either reuse their existing hardware or work with uh, work with a hardware vendor that wants some public- some publicity mm-hmm. and you know replace some systems. Oh, that'd be cool. I think it really would be fun. And to Linuxify like old systems that are stuck on Windows that aren't getting updated anymore. You know there's Vista and XP systems out yes. there that are oh, aging. Yes. Windows 8's out there that like people are looking at this going, will this run Windows 10? We could go out there and pimp their Linux rides. Or, no, pimp their pimp their rigs. We pimp their rigs. Pimp their rigs. I really think it'd be a I, I, I think it'd be such a great series. And I've thought about it, I mean, on and off for the last five years. The problem is, when it comes to actually putting the rubber to the road, it's not like businesses advertise that they're running on, on no, super no. old systems that are It's not a pride decaying. thing there, yeah. Right. So, like, are you call up and say, hey, are you running a bunch of vulnerable XP boxes that can be <laughs> hacked easily? Like, you know, that's not a great phone call. We're some amateurs who, uh, yeah. who will come over and fix it for yeah. you and film it. So I've thought about this a lot. So I've, I've thought about it and I've looked at, like, Craigslist posting, looking at, like, job postings, mm. trying to translate that to companies that might have a situation that we could help out with. But the, it just goes nowhere because nobody nobody advertises that. It's an awkward phone call to make. Right. It's, you it, need enough, like, you have to get the ball rolling with, like, a couple right. people you knew word of mouth and then yes. so that people would send you. Yes. And because we need somebody here in the Pacific Northwest, it's not very easy. It's like, hard. If it could just be anybody out there in the reach of the audience, we could probably get a few people to pop up yeah. that could hook us up or it could be their companies or something. But the thing is, is we need somebody we can drive to and film right. here in the Washington. The flight ruins the whole economics of but it. But I, you know, I, I know it sounds stupid, but I really honestly could see a whole series out of it. Like it could start here locally, but... It, it it could it could develop into us traveling mm-hmm. places to to refit people and you know th- I would love to do all of it their uh, servers do a server migration move their Wi Fi over to something better replace yeah. their firewall replace some of the end workstations like just do what I used to do for clients but do it now as like a conversion and and coverage and there would be so many little things we would run into that would be great to like dig into and mm-hmm. troubleshoot and cover those Give things feedback to the community about bug file bugs yeah. like all of that stuff we would hit would and all of it would make great content at the same time so we'd be deploying linux i'd be doing the old like consulting thing we would be fixing open source problems upstream like oh, i love all of it the issue is it is it is a fantasy. It, yeah. it, things don't work like that. You don't just call up companies and say, hey, can we come here and switch all of your computers? Like, they have to know you. They have to trust you. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't really... You this have to is, schedule downtime or whatever. They often have already, IT people already that you'd have to work mm-hmm. with who are going to be completely skeptical that you know what the hell you're doing. Right. Like, this whole thing is... it. I think we've all been misled by uh, by Ty Lopez or whatever his name is, who goes in there and remakes people's homes. Like, yes. you don't just get to walk in and knock a wall out. That's not actually how it works in business. We can't like buy them, rent them a second business they can yeah, work out yeah, of for yeah. a couple of days yeah. while we tear things you know, apart. Be, you know, you know, we should do is throw up their infrastructure on DigitalOcean for like yeah, a week, right? Exactly. <laughs> they run off DigitalOcean while we rebuild, <laughs> <laughs> and then they'd be like, "Well, why are we moving back?" <laughs> yeah, well, because well, well, right. it makes good content. Yeah, because <laughs> the uh, we we can only film the do panel as great as it is for like ten minutes, yeah. and then the audience yeah. is bored. Turns out we've covered that before. Yeah, yeah. every episode. <laughs> I know you're going to hate this idea, but I think it would be interesting at some point, and maybe it's 30 episodes in, if at some point we, at the end of an episode, reviewed 
the major conceptual points of an episode of Rick and Morty. Because the idea would be... Oh, man, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, because there's some really interesting love, concepts yes, in there. Yes, there really are. And so the, to, get, to get the audience to watch, like the fun thing would be, it's like a like you know you watch and then you come listen to the episode next week to hear us talk about it. But I wouldn't be like a long thing. I'm no, thinking like no. 10 minutes. Just the essentials. Because every episode, there's something there that makes you go... Whoa, oh man, shit, it makes whoa. you think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the best part about that show. Yeah. I mean, among all the great things about it, I I can't believe how good that show is. It's 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 amazing. I'm watching that show and I'm going, I can't believe how good how do this they do is. it? How do they do? I mean, you know, and there's like obviously there's peaks and valleys, like yeah. like all shows, but the 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 valleys aren't that low, and no. the peaks are incredible. And the way they play off past episodes and integrate in yes. the lore and all of that is just so good. It's they, so good. they walk that line too of. You know, the um, and I feel like, you know, it's like some of those things that people liked about about Tolkien or other things that you, you like you sense you're in the part of this bigger universe. Yeah. But they just there's so much going on that you you, you feel that, but you're not you don't you don't yep. care about it. Yeah. Yeah. And and then it gives you so much. What I found is there are, are a lot of really, really popular YouTube videos where for like for like 10, 13 minutes, the guy just discusses like the different things that are mm. that mm. are sort of implied by this episode and what that means and it's <clears throat> right and there's a lot of like there's tons of references to culture to all right all right i'll watch the show <laughs> but i feel like if you watch it we should make it part of the show because it's so good i'd like to talk to you about it but it, it would require us going at a slow pace yeah but they release very slowly so yes. um but it's it's so good that i and i'm not this is not like a, this is not intending to be a humble brag but it's it's so good i don't I don't rewatch shows. I don't have time to rewatch yeah. shows, and I'm legitimately thinking Hadid and I are going to rewatch this really show. You really should, yeah, uh, because it's not that long. It's too and it rewatches really well. There's so much stuff in every mm-hmm. episode. There's so much stuff, and then you you know you get different appreciations for the yes. characters by the time you've gotten to season three. So see, watching season one again is yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So we, maybe down the road we should make it the official show of User Air. Ah, that's because I feel like it's something that we the stuff we should all ponder and consider. Oh yeah, and it's a great way to segue to like science topics or like there's a ton of stuff you mm-hmm. can pull in from there. Mm-hmm. And it's such an um, anti-sci-fi trope show, too. Like, it just totally destroys so many tropes in sci-fi with just brutal reality. I mean, it shoots them right in the head, probably, is what happens. Yeah, with with just undeniable reality of this is actually probably how the universe works, and that's fucking scarier than what they made up in sci-fi. It's a great way to feel um, both great and tiny. So small. Super insignificant and Mm -hmm. also great. Yeah. I mean, it gives you that kind of reckless freedom, right? You're like, well, all right, yeah, my life does not matter. Won't change anything. Go do whatever the hell you want. Exactly. So there's Planet Earth from the BBC. Mm -hmm. And then there's Planet Earth 2, which I think is just more of the same. Right. And I think it came out like this year or recently. But I accidentally somehow started on the last episode of the season. Because Plex, that's what Plex brought up. <laughs> okay. And I didn't care. I was just desperate for offline content. And I wanted something. So when I when it does work for me at home right now, it's like super low res. Like YouTube won't go above 240p. Ooh. Netflix will play for like 25, 30 seconds and then just buffers indefinitely. So I'm like, F all of this. I want super high resolution, high bit rate, local media. And so. So like Noah's right in the back of your head, just local yeah, media, right. local yeah, media. Right. So I fire up Plex, which is all going off of an SSD now attached to my oh. uh, my uh, NVIDIA Shield. I'm, I'm, I've brought the QNAP into the studio because I we're going to do some data swap here stuff. And I end up moving around so much that it doesn't make sense to constantly power up and down a NAS. So I'm just trying to keep the stuff we're actively watching on this SSD, which the kids can watch while we go down the road. So it's, you know, it's perfect. That's great, yeah. But I don't have Rick and Morty on there. But anyways, uh, I do have Planet Earth because the kids love it. I love it. It's great background. And... Yeah, it totally is. So I hit play. It starts on the uh, episode seven, and it is a behind-the-scenes vlog kind of style <laughs> yeah. of, like, how they yeah. make Planet Earth. <laughs> Way better than Planet Earth. <laughs> Way better. Because he's like, see, like, and guys, I got to tell you, like, so many times, like, I was, like, identifying with these people that were out there doing video production. Like, yeah, we've been there. Like, <laughs> right. they're lugging around these pelican cases, and, like, things they're are way going. Way too hot, bundled and, up. Yeah, and... and things are going totally crazy for them that they didn't plan and expect. I'm like, that's how it goes. It happens to them, too. <laughs> and they're crazy professionals. Yeah, yes, yes. And so it was extremely, um, What's I don't know what it's not gratifying. It's like uh, self affirmation watching that. Like oh, even this even, shit is hard. Yeah, this shit is hard, and even for them it's hard. Yeah. And even though they plan, it still goes this way. So it made me feel good. So, anyways, episode seven of Planet Earth, 
2. It was what I watched accidentally last night because I just needed local media. And it was one of those where I was so into it. And this never happens. I was so into it. Hadi went to bed. She just she went to bed and I'm still up watching TV. And I'm like, I got I to gotta finish this. I got to know what happens wow. with these monkeys in India. <laughs> so what you need is you need a category of shows that are meta shows yes. that show how the shows that you yes. watch are made. I love that so much mm-hmm. more because to me, I'm, I'm constantly like applying it to our business and how I do production and how I shoot video and how I do photography and it's like it's, and you probably already are wondering about some of how that's done anyway when well, you're watching the regular show that's all I'm thinking about when I watch <laughs> yeah. the show well like I have two threads I'm, I'm my primary thread is watching the show but my secondary like I have two cores in my brain my right core and my left core and one core is watching the show but the other core is definitely thinking about how this is put together constantly totally like I can tell I, I am I am almost positive they must edit Mythbusters and Final Cut because I swear to God I can see the entire project on the timeline that's, when I watch that that's show. That's hilarious. And it's so distracting. It's funny because I don't really have that problem. Like when I go to watch shows, I just turn off that part of my brain. I just lose myself in the shows. So you're good at that compartmentalization. I'm I'm bad at that too. Yeah. I can't do it. I feel like I can't do it because otherwise I get an anxiety attack about wasting that amount of time. But if I'm analyzing how it's produced I am satiating that part of me that says you should be working because I always have this sensation that I should be getting something done. And so if I am doing an analysis of the production of the TV show I'm watching, it it gives that little part of me that's constantly saying you are not doing enough. You are not working hard enough. You should be doing more right now. You shouldn't be wasting this time. And I can say, but I'm but I'm analyzing how it's produced and I'm going to apply that to my own craft. See, we think completely the opposite ways because when, when I'm wasting my time, I'm deliberately going out of my way to waste my time because if I don't waste that time, I feel like I'll go insane. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I was, I was going to yeah. – I'm kind of curious about, you know, you do a lot of um, – seems like you have a lot of time that, you know, you're working on things for yourself or for, for your various jobs that you kind of have to manage yourself. So do, do you have a problem turning off at all? How do you deal with – you know, JB stuff happens all the Especially time. Especially you have to give you yourself turn a off, break. He doesn't turn off notifications, Wes. Right. He has what well, he has notifications. You can ping him all the time. I am an extremely, extremely heavy multitasker. So I I kinda have the two brains Chris has, but I just dedicate one to work and one to not work. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> You're just playing all the time. Hmm. I I am super envious of the ability to say, I'm gonna spend like uh uh, say six hours that would be i have not spent six hours doing nothing since i basically made jupiter broadcasting full-time which has been a long time now i just uh because the uncomfortableness that comes from doing nothing is so much more greater than the comfort i get from doing nothing or uh uh any other kind of reward like the uncomfort part of that's part of the reason why i vlog too is because I can turn a downtime situation into a content situation where where I where I can be editing or I could be shooting or I could be getting time lapses or I can be getting drone footage and I can convert downtime into productive time, um, which I think is part of the reason why I haven't been vlogging very much is because I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of tend to to waver back and forth. Like now, I'm starting to transition into the the period where. I want to do things with that time again, but I also want them to be fun, which is why I'm probably going to start streaming again starting this weekend. Oh, really? You're going to do it? Yeah, I'm going to start doing streaming, I think, three times a week. On Twitch? On Twitch. Where? Uh, Twitch.tv slash LP. LP. Cool. That is cool. Isn't that interesting how it comes in waves like that? Because I was was just thinking today, uh, there was a period of time where I was vlogging daily yeah and now i'm at a point where i can't even wrap my head around it i got so much going on like i can't even to me it seems like how would you do it how, how can somebody do that that seems impossible i was doing that <laughs> you and, were doing and that. now to me it seems totally and I'm, i but i can feel it's starting to chip away like yeah. i'm starting to get ideas again and i'm starting to feel momentum there i've recorded a few things in anticipation mm. like that's starting to break again it's like so i kind of know what you mean isn't it weird though it's like how can i not well, just mainline this and just keep it going it's a bit different for me because like usually the thing that stops me from doing it eventually isn't me not wanting to do it or not having the time to do it it's like all the the technical details of it end up Overwhelming. Get, get, no, they, they end up gathering problems that eventually just become too much work for me to keep fixing, and then I just give up on it for a while, <laughs> and then I find something new. 
Hmm. Like, that's why I stopped doing YouTube is because, like, the process of recording the video was pretty easy at the beginning. But then over time, these new problems kept cropping up more and more. And then eventually it's like I'm recording a 30 minute video and then I'm spending six to eight hours trying to fix that 30 minute video. Do you think that's because as you go, you learn ways to do things better or you realize, well, maybe I could do this at 60 frames per second or maybe I could shoot this at this resolution or maybe I could route audio this way. Like you learn how to make it better. And so you add more technical requirements, which adds adds more complexity, which then adds more chance for problems. No, I think it's because I'm trying to do too much on a system that's not really capable of what I want to do. But when you started, was it capable? I mean, and then you realized it wasn't capable? No, I think at the beginning I was just more willing to forgive um, the, the issues that were already yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And then as you, yeah, yep, mm-hmm, yep. Yeah, I've been there too. And then I start looking at it more, I'm like, ah, this is really a problem. This yeah. is actually a problem. This isn't up to the, the quality bar that I thought it, I wanted. And, and then the problem is you don't get excited about it. Yeah, yeah. And then it and becomes then, a chore. Then you real just quick. lose interest and you start go back to doing nothing. <sighs> Live shows. You know, mm-hmm. live shows is really how I'd like to interact with the community. I would love to do live shows one day, like a live show of Linux Action News, a live show of this, where we have like an auditorium, we go to an event, people show up. Oh, you mean like live, live. Yeah, like tour yeah. the country, book a place. That would be fun. That's what I was thinking about user error and Linux Action News is like when we do it live, let's do it in front of an audience. It's kind of exactly live. the we'll thing. We'll do it live. Yeah. Because it's the, you know, the other, the, the already live shows or whatever, like you get some of those if you listen live to it, but you don't, it seems exactly kind of like the radio mm-hmm. broadcast or other things where you get to see the behind the scenes that you would never otherwise right. see. Yeah. I think it'd be I think it'd be such a cool experience. I, today I had this crazy idea, and we're not doing this. But today I had this crazy idea of Jupiter Broadcasting Fest. Like instead of <laughs> instead of making uh, Linux Fest Northwest our big show, like we have our own fest where we fly people out. It's people too late. Out. I already booked the place. Well, there you go. But <laughs> you know what I mean. Like we hold an event somewhere. We do live shows there. We do like a like. So one of the things that was kicked around on the network a lot this year for Linux Fest Northwest, it, and it just I it just. The realities didn't work out. But one of the things we kicked around a lot was doing almost one of every one of our shows live at Linux mm-hmm. Fest and then banking it for the week. So you would have done a tech snap with Dan remote. Uh, Alan would have done a BSD now. I would have done a Linux unplugged. We would have done all of these shows, Coda Radio, all of that there at Linux Fest Northwest on Saturday. So we just bang, 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 bang them out. And people could watch all of these shows live, and then we would have a week's worth of shows, and everybody would take the week after Linux Fest Northwest off. That's an interesting idea, yeah. Yeah. Really nice idea. Mm-hmm. It just, the problem is, is it requires a ton of prep, because you have to prep every prep. single show. Yeah. And you you don't have a lot of space for gaffes, right? Right. And you have to prep every single show while you're prepping your plans for Linux Fest Northwest. And there's a fest going on all around you. And we are we're flying. You know, for us, like before the show, we're we're a huge part of our cognitive work goes towards working with the Linux Fest crew, flying our crew out here, figuring out accommodations for everybody, seeing who can pay for what, what we have to pay for, figuring, you know, all this stuff is what we spend time, what swag do we want to have at the booth, all that is stuff that we work on. But, you know, in some ways, it seems like with last spinning down and, and, and things changing, I wouldn't mind just going to Linux Fest as a participant walking around, going to the sessions, and this is not going to happen. But what I was thinking was like then at some point in the year we have a Jupiter Broadcasting Fest where we again instead of – so instead of paying for people to come to the Linux Fest, we pay them to come to – we pay for everybody to come to Jupiter Broadcasting Fest. We have a live audience in an auditorium where it's climate controlled, where there's food, mm-hmm. and we just do all of – like or a range of the shows for everybody that can make it right there on the stage. So you come and watch and you get to watch three Jupiter Broadcasting shows produced live right there on stage and those go out that week as a show. Could you combine it like may- with Linux Fest Northwest or maybe um, uh, Around Siegel? The, yeah, you know, yeah, so when you're in lo- town already for that, right? Yeah. It's a you know an op- one of those optional night things like John also Bacon. going on. Yeah, exactly. This is what John O'Bacon does with the community leadership yeah. summit. Is he like like a like a like a like a leech mm-hmm. he attaches it to a to a larger organism and sucks the sustenance off, aka the audience, 
to come to the management. Well, that's what happened with all the uh, Linux Foundation events. Remember when yeah. like the container stuff was idea. just a tiny thing? Yeah. Now it's like a full if thing. If you think about it, it's it's perfect because uh, you're al- you already have folks traveling to the area mm-hmm. anyways, and they're interested in this topic. So it's not even like a bad. It's like it's brilliant because you can leverage people being there. You can you can take advantage of the right crowd. It would actually it's a. I wonder idea. if it's also a great way to get new audience members. Like it's, it seems like it would like lower the barrier to entry if you haven't heard of the network. You're already at a Linux fest and you can just wander yeah. into an auditorium and like you get to see real people doing a real show. It's not some internet yeah. thing. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Maybe it'll happen one day. We'll see. I went to uh, dinner last night mm-hmm. with Hadia, and uh, she is she's a big fan of trying out like different beers all the time. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't like the bitter beers. Uh, that's so, ha- that's harder in this part of the world right is. now. I don't I don't know why we're IPAs so obsessed are, with it. IPAs but. are just taking off, and so she kind of knows like okay, now I don't I don't get IPAs, but she's, there's this there's this brewery in at Bellingham called Wander Brewery, mm. and she's big big fan of one of their sours that they make. Oh, like, God, one I love of her sours, favorite beers. Yeah. yeah. And so we go to dinner last night, and they give her all the beers, and uh, <laughs> she she gets the, and they say, and we have the Wander IPA. Okay, okay. Can I have the Wander IPA? And so the lady walks off. Oh, all cute girls at this restaurant too. So the lady walks off, and uh, he is like, "That was a bad choice, wasn't it?" It's like it's it's going to be bitter, isn't it? <laughs> I regret and, this already. And so then we have one of these moments where I'm like, uh, "Well, let's have a conversation about what IBUs are." And it was like this great yeah. thing where she's like, oh, so so if I just if I just kind of like Google search what the IBU is of a beer, I'll know how bitter it is, International Bitterness Unit. And so like it unlocked like the whole wow. world of her and she's like, now I get it. So I just need to buy beers that have like an IBU of around 40 and I like those beers. And it's like a whole- Suddenly this is accessible It's a her. whole new beer world. Instead yeah. of just like a hit and miss, yeah. oh God, this is terrible. So I decided to look up Rainier beer to see what, because we were trying to like compare it to other beers mm-hmm. that she's familiar with. And we around here, we, we, we commonly call Rainier beer vitamin are you know good old rainier beer right exactly everybody knows it everybody knows it in the seattle area it's a classic they got mm-hmm. a big rainier beer bu- building it's a it's not even made in seattle anymore but it's still a consider- Rainier. yeah so i looked up the ibu of rainier beer do you have a guess of what oh, man i have no idea i'm gonna go with four that's a really good guess so to, to tell you to give you like some perspective like a a, a, a a traditional like nice pale ale might have an ibu of between 20 and 30 okay um, and, uh, you know, like, a, like a, um, like a Hef might have an IBU of anywhere between 60 and 30, depending on, you know, the Hef, mm-hmm. um, Rainier beer has a zero IBU, <laughs> <laughs> zero dude, zero IBU. <laughs> wow. That's a high quality beer right there. Hey, yes, it is. We don't need no bitterness. So what is this? This is the, uh, this is the blonde ale. Di- oh, a diamond knot. So let's, oh yeah, okay. So let's go look up, uh, okay, where's my phone? This is, all you got to do, this is, yeah, you know, at the restaurant, it's real easy. All you got to do is you just go to the Googs and you just say, uh, it, you can just talk to it like a human. What is the IBU of Diamond Knot's Blonde Ale? And then usually, oh, don't keep talking, but usually uh, it gives you a result within the first, uh, like here it take, it's taking me to the Diamond Knot page, which I just, it's so, gosh, it's so good. Good job. You know what's amazing about Google? This is, you can search for anything and find it. Like specifically, like a local brew here in Seattle that's probably sold. It'll just come up. You can find it, but you go to Google Drive. I can't find shit. No, you can't find anything. I can't find anything. I was pretty impressed with the uh, Google keyboard. I was like telling you I was going to be yeah. a little bit late today, uh-huh. and uh, that was all transcribed auto magically. Really? And it was spot on. Even though I said like the word slogging and Everett. That is really good. Good I, job. It pays the G board. It se- turns out that th- all those uh, voice recordings they've got of you, they're using them for something useful. <laughs> <laughs> My big events every year are WWDC, Google I.O., and PAX. These are always what I get excited about outside of the Linux events and the open source events. But the one that I'm starting to get more excited about as I watch Nintendo from afar is E3, and I bet you Beard right here will be our E3 correspondent. What are you looking forward to? Uh, Well, actually, I was going to talk about how uh, E3 doesn't really get me excited anymore. Oh, really? Okay. Interesting. Because it feels like it's not Shocker here, Wes. Are you ready for this? (laughs) (laughs) It's not really a a big event anymore. It's it's too 
open. Like this year is Dude, the... are you hipster in E3 on me right now? Well, no, no. Well, this year, for example, is the first year that they're opening it to the public. Anybody can go. Oh, the peebs. Yeah. And the then, unwashed masses. Yeah. And then on top they of even that, have beards. I don't none know. None of the stuff that like do you remember like back in the nineties? When you heard about E3, it was like the big event where you learned about every cool new game and stuff coming out. Yeah, that's true. And you're like, look forward to it all year because that's when all the new consoles are announced. That's when all the new games are announced. But now it feels like all of that stuff gets announced before E3 even starts. Yeah, maybe even like in the like fall. All the all the console people have their events before E3. By the time E3 comes around, you just get a bunch of... Marketing. Marketing. All right. So that was sort of my perception, but uh, I was hoping that meant, I was hoping that they, that like, I guess my hope for E3 this year would be that Nintendo, Microsoft, and PlayStation and others still have a few things to show off. I, I'm, I'm kind of getting, I'm warming up to a console. I've never been a huge console person since the early Nintendo days and PlayStation days, but I'm starting to warm up to the idea as I start to just look at my computers as a way to work. Right. I was going to say, like, if you're already talking about, hey, maybe I could use a tablet at home. You seem exactly like, all right, well, I have, you know, this is what I do my browsing on. This Mm -hmm. is what I do my gaming on. And and part of it is influenced by, uh, I want to share the gaming experience with my kids and Hadia. So I want all of us to be able to sit around the television and play a game. You're no longer the like, I'm going to tune this perfect rig and then I'm going to play alone in the dark for hours. It's a family social Mm -hmm. experience. So my guess would be that you're not going to hear too much from Microsoft. And then from Nintendo, you're probably going to hear mostly about new games game switch releases and maybe their next portable console if they have one hmm. nobody's quite sure about that because the switch kind of is so a portable new. console yeah, it's, and it's so new still yeah but it's also it's it's straddling the line between a portable console and a home console because it's both really mm-hmm. yeah so nobody's sure what's going to happen with the 3ds line and then on the playstation side project morpheus which is the playstation vr stuff oh and that's probably all you hear from them. PlayStation VR. Okay. Yep. Supposedly supposed to be pretty good and probably the most approachable VR. That's what that's what appeals to me about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think I'm just about ready to embrace the USB-C lifestyle. Oh, so Mr. Pixel's going to get a new laptop over there? I mean, it's been time for, I don't know, a thousand years or <laughs> yeah. so. And I love it. <laughs> I love USB-C on my Pixel. It's yeah, great. And every time I have to charge with something else, it's just a supreme disappointment. Imagine the same power cord for your phone and your laptop. Oh, oh there are so many times where like my I, I, that would be perfect. I know. Or you could charge your cell phone from your laptop. <laughs> so which laptop? Okay, so... I haven't like needed one and I'm pretty good, you know, as a Linux user and I do a lot of stuff in the terminal or on droplets or other, you know, other people's computers as it comes down to it. Uh, So I don't, I haven't needed a super beefy machine. I've made do with with the laptop I've had. I haven't been in a rush to get something, but I think it's really time, especially with like, I just want, I want to have USB-C. I want to be done with it. I've been seeing some deals for the XPS 15. Oh. So the 13 is very appealing, right? I mean, one, it's cheaper. Uh, we've talked a lot about it on this you network. You have a 13 inch now or 11? Uh, yeah, 13, I think. It's the original yeah. Sputnik. Yeah, the original Sputnik. And I have like a 14 inch uh, latitude at, at work. So I was just like, in the past, I've kind of frowned upon 15 inch Why? laptops I mean, in do general. Do you travel a lot? No, but I do like to go work from coffee shops or bars or have a, you know, work on the couch, that You're kind so of thing. You're so Seattle, Wes. I love it. I mean, you know, when you live downtown, you kind of have yeah. to. Yeah, and especially right now when you don't have internet yeah, at home. Yeah, I don't have internet at home. Yeah. <laughs> and sorry. I like to I'm be able to, you know, I'll go sometimes, I'll go over to a friend's house and we'll just kind of hack on stuff together. So it's really nice to just be able to yeah, like throw sure. it in a bag and go. Uh, but what's drawing you to the larger screen now? Well, one, I really like the, you know, it is, it's a smaller frame. So it's not a full 15 inch yeah. kind of laptop. Yeah. Um, it's got that edge to edge display. Really, really what it is for me is I want, you know, I don't want to have to buy another laptop really soon. And so the XPS 15 has one RAM slot that you can upgrade, Ooh. whereas the XPS 13, it's all soldered on. Uh. Um, also, I can get a quad core processor, so I won't necessarily need that all the time. Uh, the other factor, I don't, I really didn't, for a long time, I was like, I kind of don't want a GPU on there because the mobile GPUs are never amazing anyway. Um, on Linux, there's 
questionable hoops, whereas Intel always, you know, it seems to work so well out yeah. of the box. And and the hit on battery life is definitely and noticeable. And the hit on battery life is noticeable. Um, but I have been doing some, some playing with some machine learning things. So, oh, really? So it might be interesting from that angle. And it does feel like it makes it a little more, you know, it might extend the life. It makes it a little more well-rounded of a machine. My, my personal experience, too, is the desktop UIs tend, to, I mean, the new Intel video graphics are very good. But They are, yeah. I really feel like I notice a slight improvement on proprietary graphics still. So it really comes down to that RAM issue, because I see a lot of deals for that, for, for XPS laptops, but they're not, they're not expect the way that I would want. So having that, like, I don't mind being able to pop it open and change, you know, I might do that, you know, the common change of change of the Wi-Fi to the, in, buy an Intel Wi-Fi and switch it out for yeah. whatever. Yep. So like, I'm okay doing that. I'm, I'd be certainly okay adding an extra RAM a couple years down the road. So yeah, that's that I, I'm, I'm really glad you're thinking about that because that is one of the biggest trends I am concerned about right now in laptops is soldered on, soldered yeah. on RAM, soldered on storage. Exactly. So my, my only real concerns were, is it going to be too big? Um, I, I think I think not. I'm I'm gonna go look at the sizes I'm a and maybe spec it. I'm I know a little it's worried. Uh, I and it you. is heavier. I, it is also heavier. I think it'll be okay because it's a 15 inch laptop, but it's a 15 inch laptop in a smaller frame than every other 15 inch laptop. Yes, right. So and, and it's thinner, and yeah. then you you know then laptops have been in the past, um, and I do think Linux is slightly better with a dedicated GPU, mm-hmm. although there is sometimes a little more hoops you have to go through, but I don't feel like it's anything you could And handle. I don't need extreme battery requirements. I can usually find an outlet. Anything, you know, uh, like well, five, you go, five or above hours are probably fine for well, me. Well, and imagine a two-year down the road future where USB-C is totally ubiquitous right. in your house. So that was, I was thinking about like the Galgo, but it doesn't have USB-C power. I'm just, I can't, I yeah. can't buy a new laptop without that. I agree. It's where you got to go. It's, yeah. it's totally where you got to go. So uh, I might just have to pull the trigger, I think. Because I was thinking about maybe a ThinkPad, like seeing mm-hmm. some of the stuff Noah's mm-hmm. running, but mm-hmm. I don't, I don't really want to support Lenovo if I don't have to. And the one thing that I, I like about those is how easy it is to get them to include the LTE modem right built right in. That seems, yeah, that, yeah. that would be pretty handy. Yes. That said, if I have easy USB-C, I can tether from my phone, no problem. Does the, um... 15 XPS 15 have Ethernet? Do you I don't, know? I don't think so. Mm, That's let's, okay let's for look. me too. Hold on, let me look. I'll yeah, look. you should look though. XPS 15 Ethernet, because that just seems like if it, if you had e- oh no no <laughs> no it doesn't. Boy, that would be a that would that would close it for me right there. I tell you what. However, with USB C again, that, I have that a is the thing. Them. I'm also thinking that I might just bite the bullet right now and buy or wait a little bit and see if that stabilizes but i'm definitely down to buy a, a usb you know a nice mm-hmm. thunderbolt yes h- h- dock yeah yeah i have one on i have one on pre-order right now from owc oh. that just got just got delayed but it's it i think it can drive two 4k monitors it's a thunderbolt 3 usb c dock great. yeah it's really nice got it's got sd card readers and the reason and it's it's not the cheapest out there yeah. but uh, i owc has a good reputation but uh the, the nice thing about I'm, okay, I'm going to preface this. Not a big fan of dongles. No. Straight sure. up. But I'm going to preface it with this. You buy them once, and I already have three systems that it works on. Yeah. So all I can put gigabit Ethernet on three of my systems. I can hook this dock up to three of my systems. That's awesome. So there is some advantage to it. Externalizing it means that the core system, the little tiny little r- laptop, or the huge laptop, I can, I can, I can interchange those depending on, right, depending on the work. Yeah, exactly. And like for me, I only, you know, I have a desk at home and then otherwise I'll probably be using it as a laptop. So I'm okay with that. And with the Sputnik I have now, I already have a dongle to convert from DisplayPort to HDMI and a USB to Ethernet dongle that I use occasionally. So I'm like, I'm already in the dongle lifestyle. All right, I got to ask you. I don't know. Thinking about the beard, I don't know. The beard, the beards, you know, the beard's a desktop guy. Mm-hmm. I I would like to be again at some point. So just, this is where I was going to go. You just said. I mean, you just said that all of your stuffs up on do or on other people's computers and you're SSHing in. So why not Chromebook it or I stick could, it out with yeah. the current laptop and then go all in on a big old desktop and really, really have a nice GPU where you could really do machine learning. Uh, that is that is another idea. So I I could get the I could get an XPS 13 now. To, to appease my, mm-hmm. you know, nicer laptop need. And then yeah, plan... Yeah, because laptop is legit old. Yeah, exactly. And then plan to... And that could be a, a, a much... You know, you can get those. They're, they're not crazy expensive right. now. So then... And then plan to budget more for a nice desktop. That's an actually... That's a very interesting what you, idea. What do you think, Beard? Have I prescribed a potential solution? Or yeah. have I just caused more delay? Deci- more decision fatigue? I think if he... he weren't going to get the XPS 15, though, I might recommend him the Razer Blade Stealth. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> but well, he wants to run Linux. It runs Linux. 
I do want to run Linux. It's true. Does it have the USB-C power? That's the... I believe it does. Okay. I believe it also has an Ethernet port. Oh. Which one? The Razer Stealth? All yeah. right. Guess what? Chris is going to go. You're gonna, you got to Google it. <laughs> I got to Google I th- this. I'm pretty sure. I yeah. know I, well, most I, of their lines. I, 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 I grant you these are really nice computers. And if I was going to run Windows 10, I think I would definitely do this. Um, yeah, that is a nice machine. I say. If, you go, if you go and uh, look up the Razer Blade Stealth on the ArchWiggy, there's an article dedicated to how to See, that's, use it. See, that's, that's the checklist right really? there. Really? Really? Yeah. I've also heard they overheat a lot and that it doesn't get enough publicity and that people aren't talking about the fact that these things overheat a lot. Have you heard that at all? Because I've, What that's kind what... of weird forums are you hanging out on? <laughs> yeah, you I, hear I know people things. that actually own these and they don't complain well, about Well, I that. went over, I'll tell you, out of, you want to know where I went? Out of all of them, I went to the it, Linus tech forums. Okay, yeah. And people in there have been buying them because Linus talks about them all the time. Mm. And people are in there grousing. So then they link to some support article on Razor where people are trying to raise hell because they're overheating constantly and ports are dying. And I looked at that and I went, oh, doesn't officially support Linux. It's a low volume manufacturer. I, I, am, I, I am transitioning to a point in my life where I feel like there is value in a high volume manufacturer. Because I, if I want a really boutique system, I build it off of parts mm-hmm. I get off of Newegg or Amazon. Or I, I beg the beard to build it. And if I want a system that's going to be like my rock solid, turns on every day for the next five years, doesn't give me any problems, I think there's real value to your HPs, Dell, and Apples who are building millions of these things and really have this thing figured out. You're not really a tinkerer anymore, at least not at least for your non-work hours, right? right? And so I'm you, a don't, you don't want to have my to personal customize. stuff, but when it comes to work stuff, I want it as pliant like as possible. Mm-hmm. And because of that, and we've been working towards that here in the studio, and so because of that. Uh, it was like 15 minutes before WWDC on Monday. I'm like, yeah, I'll go live stream it because I knew I could just walk in, push a couple of buttons, be live, and things would just work because we've been – and these these are custom-built boutique systems with a purpose. Uh, so I'm not saying that one's better than the right. other and things like that, but for a work machine that is your workhorse where you're using that to get – code developed. Especially where, you know, those kinds of things where you want that low latency, where you're like, I need to be able to open this up, know that it will come back from suspend every time. I'll be able to just open it. It doesn't right. hang, and I just, yeah. I can send my email. And I'm telling you, it's not only somebody who's, you know, I've, I've, I've used the most modern XPS, but also I own uh, one from a couple years ago. There is a there's right. a build quality there that is... Uh, they seem like they've really hammered out a lot of issues mm-hmm. with that design, and mm-hmm. they're pretty rock solid, mm-hmm. it seems like. I, I, but I would, I would, so all that, I'd say if you do go, uh, I think the XPS line is a great way to go. I just, uh, Wes, you seem like out of almost all the people that we talk to frequently, you would be the best suited to have like a low end terminal and a super high end machine prob- back at you're home. You're probably right about that. Yeah. Cause you know, you're not, you're not afraid to like maybe do a little VPN to get to the machine to, to not, run a job on it. You not know, at all. No. A little remote desktop or something like that. Yeah. No big deal. Oh boy. That's. I know. I know. That's you a could, good point. You could leverage you could leverage your experience to to make this work. I already more game than... on a different machine anyway, so oh, like, really? that's yeah. not even you know. I mean, I, w- I might want to play Race the Sun, but beyond yeah. that, like it, that's yeah. fine. Well, and if you built a system, a desktop that was good at machine learning, it would be good. It at It would gaming. be good at gaming. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Same with editing. You build a nice editing system, and you right. often get a good gaming system, unless it's a Mac. Boy, you've really you've kind of changed my perspective. I mean, I think we talked about that idea before, but I mm-hmm. you know, I'd seen these XPS 15 deals and yeah. I was like, "Huh, oh, maybe I should just but- the, um, I've got one more curveball cuz you could go Oh man. See, this is this is Ooh, hard. Yeah. All right. All you right. You could live on an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you do just the Apple Watch, no yeah, phone, yeah. just the watch? <laughs> oh, oh. Blah! No. Uh what I was going to suggest is I don't know what the I don't remember how the uh, setup is on the XPS 13 and 15s, but if their Thunderbolt 3 slash USB C port has four PCI lanes, or maybe even if it has less, according to Wimpy, you could consider an external GPU down the road. I have I think it I think the number I saw was four, but I also saw some people saying that that there were some qualms with that that it wasn't like the full amount that you might want well, going here's forward. The thing. Here's the thing: uh, it, it, if you think about the workload, and I could be wrong. Totally correct me if I'm wrong, but the workload of machine learning is going to be less about pushing data over the PCI bus and more about the compute power of the GPU, right? And so this is where two lanes versus four lanes matters. Is if you're trying to push raw graphics data, you need as much PCI bus as possible. But if you're giving the GPU a compute job and then it's handing you back answers 
I, I th- it may be less of a concern. Though. Yeah, I think yeah. you can get by That's with a really good question, family. right? Yeah, and I wouldn't be concerned. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily care for the the gaming angle. I mean, I, I like gaming, but I'm not a hardcore gamer. I don't need 60 FPS on crazy HD. So you really, it's getting to the point where you could you could get a nice laptop. So what about the like? I see. You. Yeah, exactly. I I also see like the Asus ZenBook series. Mm-hmm. Those are and mm-hmm. those are a little cheaper as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's another route to go if you had a nice, powerful desktop. Mm, but I don't know or if those so. have the USB C charging though, and that's the that's a deal breaker. Gotta have that. Yeah, deal breaker. USB C life. I'm excited to replace all the all the other peripherals and and those kinds of things. Are you really? Yeah. I mean, I don't have that many as it is, and I'm just I all never old. liked USB USB any of the other ones. I mm-hmm. mean, it's, it's who who does. I'm really worried that the robots are going to take over the world. Because think about it. If you're a robot and you want to learn something new, you just download that package, you install it into your brain matrix, and boom, now you're an expert. Humans, we don't have that luxury. But there's one thing that could save humanity, and that's Linux Academy. Save humanity by programming your brain. Upgrade your knowledge set. Improve your data banks. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. A platform to learn more about GNU slash Linux. All of the things around it that actually make you money, like your open stacks and your Azures and your AWS and the things that are, well, I won't say that, but I'm just going to say this. There's things there. They're going to upgrade your mind and prevent a robot uprising. I can't say more than that. I've signed an NDA, but Terminator is real. And Linux Academy is the only solution. So go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged, get comprehensive study guides, try out their lab servers, spin them up on demand, SSH in, and work in a real environment. Learn this stuff so that way when you go test, you've actually experienced it. Or when you go use it in production, you've got that confidence. Study guides are available. Human mentors are available if you need something. A great community. Study cards. The list goes on and on, including mobile apps and more. Check it all out and get a free seven-day trial. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring User Air. So, Wes, your new laptop has me thinking. You're probably going to do Gnome Shell on this new laptop. I mean, that would be the default, mm-hmm. but maybe I shouldn't. What if? So let's let's all let's go around the table. I'll start my preferred Linux desktop right now, Gnome Shell. Although I may, I think I'm making a transition soon. Yours? I would say Gnome Shell and Be- Plasma for Beard. Yep, KD Plasma okay. Five. So let's play a game. Let's pretend like we all of a sudden. Now live in a reality where our favorite desktop environments don't exist. Plasma Project never got started. Gnome Shell doesn't exist. Okay? Yeah. yeah. What do you, Wes, what do you put on your laptop? I would go with Sway, which is the i3 lookalike for Wayland. Because I'm actually very curious in trying it, and I've seen the developer like on some Reddit comments and stuff, and it seems like it's a cool project with some of the right ideas, and I'm also kind of a closet tiling window manager fan. Sway? I, I, yeah. Okay, Okay. so where do I go to find out more uh, about Sway? Sway WM, I think. Something Look like that. Type you. Sway, Wayland, you'll find it. You have been, uh, you've been following this, haven't you? Oh, I, I like it. I had this. seen it like a while ago. We might have even talked about it on Plugged ages oh, really? ago. I think very briefly. Um, yeah, this look does this does look really nice. I will uh, try to link it in the show notes if people want to check it out. I have not tried it yet, but I was like I've seen it mentioned more recently, so I'm definitely interested. Sway does look it looks like uh, so uh, like if you're going to go tiling window manager on Wayland, this is the way to go. It does seem like that. I3 is also kind of appealing I3's to me sometimes. I3 is nice, yeah. Um, and if it's a machine where I'm doing a lot of terminal work or uh, input work, mm-hmm. I, I could definitely see that. All right, so uh, I got mine, but I'm going to save it. Uh, Beard, what about you? What would you switch to if uh, if just say Plasma never existed? Mate. Really? Yeah. It's the next best thing. Like, you don't have Gnome with all its fancy extensions. You don't have Plasma with all its everything awesome. Next best thing is Mate, especially Ubuntu Mate, because it's super polished. Hmm. But I'm not sure I would go with Ubuntu Mate just because I love Arch so much. So I was originally thinking, mate, when I when I suggested this mm-hmm. as what I was kind of going to, but then I really started thinking about my preferences, and I got to be honest with you guys, I would be honestly pretty tempted to just switch to elementary OS. Yeah, it's yeah. really Ubuntu, and it, it, but it's Ubuntu with such a great environment on top of it, and a team that is really thinking stuff through, and I like where they're going, and they've they've uh, they've really gotten good at delivering on what they say they're going to do. It's a passionate project. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is controversial because especially now that I've I've met Wimpy, like I love Ubuntu Mate. I think it's a great project. I, I, I think what they're doing is they've done a lot of innovations and it seems like with a model of a, a well-run endeavor. 
but I installed Mate on a laptop for my mom that I got. Uh, Ubuntu Mate? Yep, at a hardware sale from work. And I just, it, it just it just wasn't the right thing. It yeah. just didn't, you yeah. know, yeah. especially compared because I also installed Windows 10 on it. Oh. And Windows 10 just felt more Smooth? approachable. Oh, really? You know, like I even played with like I showed I showed her the various, you know, I love that you can like the, the Mate tweak settings. You can make it, you know, Redmond or Cupertino or whatever. So it was like, I think like maybe one of the dock ones. I think we ended up on the Mutiny one that kind of looks like Unity. But I was trying to make it, you know, I thought it'd be easy with the application menu and, and all those things. But it just, it w- it was too much. And like the, the Windows taskbar is bigger. It's easy to find. It's easy to click. Um, so I, I think something like, like elementary or that really might be, might be the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I would, I would definitely miss arch and I don't know if I'd be willing to switch away from arch to get Mm. there. So I would have to play around with I3 or maybe sway, uh, on to arch. But right now, uh, so the reason why I brought this up is because right now I'm thinking like if I'm moving away from Gnome, I think I'm probably going to Plasma. But I was trying to entertain the idea of I took Plasma out of the equation. What else, what else would, what else is there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you brought that up about uh, Mate. Um, we ran Mate here in the studio for a year. And then when we redid everything and reloaded our systems, we decided at that point to switch over to Gnome Shell. When it, and, the, and the big thing that, s- that sort of changed for us was that we had to use these systems daily now. Uh, it was right. Several times a day, multiple people had to sit here and interact with these systems. And for some reason... To me, Gnome Shell seemed like a better direction to go. That's where I was ending up. And, and you know, I think I think my different appliance would be just fine because you're like, oh, yeah, I need to set up this, you know, run the configure for this thing. And you can go find it in the application menu pretty easily. But I really just started to miss, like, you know, I can Alt F2, but it wasn't the same as the super key. You're already typing and your app is launched. Yeah. So Beard, now now we, we, we destroy this false yeah. reality. Yep. We go back to actual reality where Plasma and Gnome Shell do exist. Uh, I, I keep kicking around the idea with you of you having a Linux rig uh, up in your uh, in your den upstairs. The beard nest. Yeah, the, in the beard nest. That's a that's a good name for it. The beard nest. I like that. Because <laughs> there's, probably, now, there's I, probably a lot of beard hair. I'm now there? a beard bird. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> some sort of some sort of great bird. The the uh, the question becomes: Would you actually deploy plasma? Yeah. Why not? I think I would run a distro that most people haven't considered for plasma though. Slackware. No, Netrunner. Oh, Netrunner. Because something I recently learned is that Netrunner is based on KDE Neon, for one. It is? According to our, our, our producer, Michael, he said it was based on KDE Neon. And secondly, it looks amazing out of the box. So most of the problems I have with tweaking, well, the tweaking's already done for me. Okay, I'm checking it out right now. I'm looking at this. Huh. Interesting, Beard. Interesting. All right. All right. So now I need to check out Netrunner is what you're saying. Yeah. I'll put a link to this in the show notes too. If and when I make the switch, I really want to try to go all in this time. Like I really want to just embrace it, try to learn it. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be shopping. I'll be shopping distros. I think mm-hmm. I'll stay arch, but I'm going to shop distros too, just to make sure I can really nail the implementation. You know, after producer Michael on the, the most recent Linux Unplugged was talking kind of about the, the way he does tiling in Plasma, I'm also interested in that because... Like G tile looked interesting in in uh, GNOME Shell world, but I really do prefer keyboard shortcuts. So if I can get that's that's where like for a while I was on Cinnamon, and it worked out pretty well for me, just because I could split it four ways, super easy, and ninety percent of the time that's all I need, or like you know one big one and then two small ones. It, it, I don't need a ton of crazy tiling to get by my, my usual workflows. So I think I think I could find a happy home in Plasma as well. I feel like if I could find a distro that had KD out of the box like KD Neon does, but has the Pac-Man package manager, that oh. would be the distro for me. But that doesn't currently exist. Anagross does have a Plasma desktop option, but it's not like Netrunner configured or yeah. something like mm. that. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, apparently uh, one dude, having heard about my user housing situation, decided that the best option for me is to move to Alabama because it's it's cheap to live there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel like they didn't count in the fact that, you know, I, I work for Jupiter Broadcasting for one. <laughs> and um, So you have to move to North Dakota then. And two, uh, there's not really great internet connectivity in Alabama. Well, that's a deal breaker. Yeah. And uh, three, it's also super hot as fuck. 
Yeah, but does it feel it feels super hot as fuck right now, Rikai? Yeah, but it, it's like but there it's like it, really super yeah. hot. <laughs> yeah, like, that's true. It's like brain baking. And this is a, we only need we have like three months of the hot only. Yeah, Wait, but you don't fantasize about the fact that you could do your job from anywhere in the world if you had good internet. Like to me, that is such a huge appealing aspect of this job that I do not take enough advantage of, and I travel all the time. We need like a you know like an average apartment price to internet speed ratio because yeah. I would love that, man. Yeah, let's see what I. I appreciate that fact, but I feel like I want a, a good home base before I mm. go and travel okay. to other places. What I would like, and if anybody in the audience, maybe they could be helpful, this could be a chance. I, I have not seen it. It's like a route planning mapping software that shows you the cellular signal. It, Open Map has something close to it where you can put in locations and see what providers and where their antennas are at oh. and things like that. Open Signal is really great for that if you're going to an area and you want to mm-hmm. know how the signal is going to be. But there's nothing that really incorporates it with, like, navigation and mapping. Because I just say, like, okay, Alabama is a little crazy in some sense. Maybe not. I mean, you could hang out with uh, Producer Michael. But I don't think the idea itself is that is that far out. Like last, like, last week, one of the things that I think you and I both agreed on is there are just some places in the new reality. I, I call it the new economy. I know this is a super debaggy term. But <laughs> I really believe, like, the self-employed, self-contracted, entrepreneur-type worker who's uh, their own small business is going to be a larger and larger part of the economy, especially in the tech slash knowledge workers. I hate talking like this. I sound like an idiot. But the reality is, I think it's true. And when you become somebody who is working on the computer and all of your job is in the computer in some digital sense, you really do, especially when you're working for yourself, have the flexibility of working anywhere. Like, Wes, you probably often work remote, right? I, I would assume. I do. I do sometimes work from home. Yeah. Have you ever worked when traveling? Yeah, yeah. No, so I've worked from you know I've worked from visiting friends or or parents' houses or at conferences. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever fantasize about working and traveling continuously? Yeah, you know, I, I am definitely interested in that. I think that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, I think the trick is getting you know finding something. So like what you're talking about is definitely is definitely on the right path. You know, you need to be in an environment where you really understand the problem domain. You understand the things you're doing, and you have established. You know, you've good methods of high bandwidth communication. You know, it's going to be good. Or partners or team members who you already have a good dialogue with. Yeah. So I think, like, what's stopping me at the moment is like, I think it would be hard. It'd be very interesting, and I'm open to doing it, but, you know, to transition to both a new line of work or, you know, a new type of work as well as being remote only. Um, whereas something where like you, you're migrating to remote only, that seems like it would be a lot easier Mm -hmm. because I do really value sometimes, especially on some, you know, some types of problems, like having that face-to-face communication is, is really nice. I've had audience members offer me just the most amazing things. Like the offer they've offered me to like park at their place for a while when we're traveling and stuff. That is amazing. Uh, which I have not yet actually done, but it seems like it'd be such a cool opportunity because not only would I get a spot to park the rig, but then like we get to hang out and maybe he could show me or she could show me some of the local like, you know. That sounds And yeah. you could vlog that? Yeah. This is totally something down the road I want to do. Uh, and they likely, if they're a listener of our podcast, they probably have good internet too. So, you know, it's, like, it's a very romantic notion. And, and I love it. It is. You know, and yeah. like it's most of the things that I do. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't matter where I am. I just need SSH right. and I'm good to go. I'll tell you what, what drives me is you're right. It is a romantic idea and it's a romantic idea that doesn't actually seem unachievable. Right. It's not a false romance. Right. And so uh, the way, where I get weird about it is of course because i can't just like be like well no. I, you know i travel about once a quarter and that's good right i have to i have to like take it to the extreme and the extreme that i take it to is well when i'm 75 years old and i'm looking back at my 30s well i regret the fact that i acknowledged that this was something i could do and that my work makes it possible and that i didn't just grab that opportunity by the horns and go for it i got to imagine when i'm 75 mm-hmm. years yeah, old I'm that's a good way at, to think about holy it holy shit i was young i had a ton of energy i lived in an rv i worked on an internet job where i did podcasts how what the hell was i doing being parked in any one location more than a few days the only thing the only nut i can't crack is it was really i what i to make it all work is i feel like i'd have to make enough money where i can fly the kids out to see me i was gonna say that right yeah. like kids that kind of stuff that's what makes it hard i, I have dogs right. so which isn't quite yep. the same but it's but yeah, the, you know it's, it's like, like you have somebody that needs you and yeah. has to be and so i i i look at that and i think that's the only that's the only catch. But if you can solve that particular problem, seventy five year old Chris is going to be a lot more happier with mm-hmm. me. And I don't want to piss that guy off. No, he's already going to be grumpy enough. And at the end of the day, he has the final say. It, he really does. Man, I feel like I'm the, the total opposite of you guys. Like, you you guys say all that stuff, and it sounds great. Sounds like an adventure. But then I think about it, and I'm like, 
man, that sounds like a huge amount of extra stress. You're constantly on the road. You constantly have to reevaluate like your internet situation to make sure you have a a place to that you can come back to. And I don't know, it's just too much for me. It is a lot of new stuff constantly thrown in your face. Yeah. New locations, new streets, mm-hmm. new names. Meanwhile, I could just get a house and chill out. <laughs> See, I feel like I have both of those elements. You know, like I do, I do really appreciate a nice home base, somewhere comfortable. I, I think what I'm really interested in now, kind of about about the traveling or the being able to do that, is the kind of what we hit on earlier is being able to pare down. You know, like because you do that, you really your essentials, your go bag or whatever, it really has to be nailed in, and you have a really good understanding of what that is. Which I feel like in my house, like. I could certainly do a better job. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's on me that I don't, but there's a lot of extraneous things. There's a lot of workflows that aren't optimized just because I don't need to. Mm, yeah, that's a great point. I love the concept of the go bag. Uh, as we record this episode, it's Wednesday, June 7th. <clears throat> and my mom, uh, 15 to 20 minutes before we started this episode, asked me to travel to Edmonton, Canada tomorrow. With uh, Wow. Her. Yeah. That sounds fun. It, you know, we have family up there, and uh, her brother, who's, um, I think he's like 25, mm-hmm. really great guy, great family up there. Her, She's adopted. Mm. Uh, he, she was adopted here in the States, but her biological family, which she found later in her life, after I was like 10 years old, um, is from Canada. Interesting. It is a yeah. fa- it's a story I should go into sometime because it really is a unique and fascinating, like finding the biological family, hiring an mm-hmm. investigator- all of it. That whole sounds like yards. the whole thing, yeah. And so, you know, f- fast forward 17 years later and good relationships with the family, but we don't get to go see them very often because they're up in uh, in Alberta. My my grandma, you if you're up in the Alberta area, she's Professor McGuire. She's a professor. She was. She's retired now, a professor of uh, philosophy. And they live in that area. And then my grandpa, who passed away a few years ago, owned a huge farm up there. Huge, huge, huge farm. And uh, it's a big family. And they're having a huge party this weekend. Whoa. They're going 400 miles out of town to an Indian reservation, and they're having a wedding and a party. That sounds awesome. So she calls me. First she telegrams me. Then she calls me 15 minutes before I come downstairs for the show. And she's like, can you go with me? I'm not going to go unless you go. I'm like, oh. Oh, geez, mom. Mom, I got like three shows. Yeah. I got to rec- like. I just felt I felt so bad that I didn't just have like a go bag and a plan. Like right. I want to be yeah, able to of say, course, "Mom, I'll meet you at the airport, Mom." Yeah, like that's what I would love to be able to say. And then knowing that, but where we're going, we're going to be four hundred miles away from, from what, internet. Anything, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I just I just couldn't. If I had maybe even a week's more notice, I could mm-hmm. have asked maybe like you to fill in on a show or something like that. But it just you know it would just dropped it on me just in like an hour ago. Right, that's 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 hard to plan. But it, it, it totally sort of still hurt because like I want to be able to do it and I'm going to regret not being there for that huge party. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're going to have a massive fire. Can I can I go with her? I know, that right? sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, that's what Angela said. She's like, maybe I'll go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And so it, 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 is, it is one of those things where you like, you wish you could, you, 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 romant, you romanticize about the idea of just, I'm going to grab my laptop I'm going to grab a tablet and my phone. I'm going to have internet wherever I go. Mm -hmm. I can do my work and I might be offline a little bit more, but I'm still going to get stuff done. And it's, it's where it feels like things are going, but the reality is when it, when the opportunity arose, I just couldn't, you couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It's still not quite there yet. There's still too many pieces to work out. That's because uh, Elon Musk's internet satellites aren't in orbit yet. Or Facebook's balloons Mm -hmm. or Google's drones or something like that. Yeah. The thing I took away from that uh, is that your mom is on Telegram, and I recently got my mom on Telegram too, and it's great. Uh, I love not having to like open te- like a yeah. text app yeah. or uh, right, and no more Facebook Messenger. No Facebook Messenger. I'm not checking Facebook Messenger. No, no my mom not. is also on Telegram now. Really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, nice. <laughs> because I didn't want to do a Facebook Messenger. Exactly. Good so for my you. my dad is a uh, he's he, he's a book guy. He worked in a bookstore for years. Not he's a self-described luddite. He doesn't. I mean, he used a computer and like you know, like Windows XP using their catalog software. Uh-huh. You know, like to get his job done, he can yeah. certainly use a tool, but he sure. does not use computers except for doesn't, email. Doesn't light him up. He's about to get an iPhone six. Uh, his buddy, like you know, got the new one and didn't need his old one. Uh, so I think he might be on Telegram too now. That's wow. gonna. This is gonna be fun. The thing that I have found interesting about my family members, who I would describe exactly like that. Perfectly smart people, just doesn't yeah. necessarily interest them. Mm-hmm. Has never really been relevant in their life. They've made it into their 50s, never needed it. Right. Um, and plus. And 
all of them now have either a smartphone or an iPad. And it, it, really, it really shows you that that particular type of interface and portability and um, it's sort of like functionality paired with necessity to some degree. Yeah. But and ubiquity of internet connectivity makes it approachable to people who've never and used I think it's, computers. I think it's caught on in that group too. Like I think they, mm-hmm. they, it's, we've reached a point where they've seen other people in their yep. life that are in that position. They're like, yeah. oh well, that you know, this person's doing it, so yeah. maybe I'll try. Yeah. I think it's only good for us, though. I mean, as long as it's not Facebook Messenger anymore, I'm happy. Actually, it is good for us because all of those things are connecting to services. They're connecting to to uh, demons running on Linux. I mean, it, at the end yeah. of the day, like all of these things are connecting to systems or infrastructure that our audience or yourself are managing or creating. So it, it actually is really good for us because it makes it, – it, that is the ironic side of cloud computing is it makes – this mass adoption by consumers of technology. Even iOS and iCloud stuff. Uh-huh. That's got Linux servers back there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that something? It's funny. We don't ever talk about it, really. But it, the, the reality is, is this consumerization of technology has meant jobs for sysadmins, developers, and it's meant way more Linux, you know, way more Linux servers. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. I think on like a, a human level, too, it, it's kind of fighting back against the, the concept of technology is isolating us. It, in some mm. ways, it's also bringing us together because you're yeah. talking to people you yeah. normally just wouldn't talk to anymore. However, I do feel like th- th- the real world is becoming more like the internet comment section of any oh, horrible site every day. Like, like yeah. things are very charged now to talk about the things that did not used to be political mm-hmm. are now political. You don't even have to cite a reference. Like everybody knows them. It's just the way it is now, especially here in the states. And I got and, and it seems like outside the states too is happening, but where I see it, and I I do wonder as more of the normals get on the internet, if society doesn't turn into right. essentially which the way Twitter does this tip? Yeah, does society just become like social networks? <laughs> This show's really gonna fuck me over. It's really gonna get me good because it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna cost me my editor. It's gonna cost me. Uh oh. Yeah, I, I know it's. I can see it now because it just, it's a natural trajectory. The beard, I think, will probably eventually. I got to imagine. If you keep this up, people are loving the beard. They want you to launch your own show. People want yep. the people want the beard hour. Like you're gonna become a full fledged host. And it's not even. I've actually gotten messages asking me I know, when I'm, I'm gonna kidding. get my own show. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it. I mean, that's. Yeah, what do you think? Do you see that? Could you see eventuality where you put down the editors? What do, what is what do editors have? A gauntlet, chops, chops, uh, blades, mouse. blades, a mouse. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I would very much like to do that. I, I feel like I'm pretty burnt out on editing, to be honest. After mm. doing it essentially five, Daily. six days a week, nonstop yeah. for like how many years have I been here now? Three years and change, three yeah. and a half years. So yeah. what what kind of show would you be interested in doing? That's I'm curious. Well, about. I was talking to Chris earlier. I uh, I think uh, the first show I'd probably want to do is something gaming related because that's what I have an interest in. Mm, mm-hmm. Not sure what specifically I would do, but that's that's the general idea. I would watch that, and then trying to figure out who would be a good co-host for that, and I think it would be someone completely away from JB. I don't know mm-hmm. who yet, but probably somebody that's uh already got an established audience that uh has I mean, some that's of not a bad idea that yeah. can that can show the beard to new people oh. right i mean that would be the idea is to is to to try to t- to be a show that just grows jb in general so we can mm-hmm. part of the thing is is like uh you uh it's not like we move away from linux it's like if we can have other hosts now step in to focus on stuff that can grow jupiter broadcasting while those of us like yourself, myself, Noah, who are all focused, and Alan, who are really focused on Linux and open source, it gives us more bandwidth, gives us right. gives us more resources. Keep that more free, niche, but yeah. add, add some other related mm-hmm. areas. Well, not mm-hmm. only that, but it brings in it could bring in other people that might not know much about Linux, and then they they happen across the other shows yeah. in the network. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the halo. And you effect. introduce people to Linux. Yeah, the halo effect of it. Or you introduce Linux people to gaming. Yeah, that's a possibility too. I suppose it could happen. Yeah. Stranger things have mm-hmm. happened. I would say it's a, it's not likely. I'll switch all the Linux users to Windows because the games are. Damn it, beard. <laughs> 
yeah. All right. So that that would be that would be really cool. I mean, the show would you know it'd have to be a show that could pay for you. Yep. And then yeah, you could make that. And I feel like. I feel like it would be a natural transition for you, which is sort of funny now looking at it because when you first started, you probably never really thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. What about yourself, Wes? Let's get inside Wes's head for a second. Oh, it's crowded in here. Uh, yeah, hello. Wes is hello. transitioning from being a host to an editor. <laughs> well, so, so, geez, Wes. Yeah, now you got two shows you're doing. Does it, does it, did, did adding a second show, that, isn't that interesting how adding a second show is, it's, it's a big deal. Like it's, yeah. It's a big, it's like another relationship. In it some is sense. It's a very different relationship yeah. in, in many ways. Do you, do you find that there, have you found a point where doing the shows complements your professional career in a sense? Because now that you, because you're, you're not like a contractor, you're not somebody who's trying to market himself. You're not somebody who needs to grow a Twitter following. Like these are always incentives for other hosts. Like, like take somebody like Alan mm -hmm. who has scale engine. Oh, right. right. Yeah. So by being on these shows, he's promoting scale engine. He's driving customers. People le learn his people discover by watching the shows that he really is an expert. That's a really good point. And he really knows his shit. And so if you know, if you have a, if you have something you need done and you want to go to somebody that knows their shit, Alan Jude is really, Call them right up. Right. And so like right now with C file, like if you want somebody that's gonna implement a great C file implementation for your business, people are calling up AltaSpeed and asking Noah to set up C file for them. So for them, it, 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 it there's things that are outside of the podcast sphere for them. But you, I don't really see it there. Like you have I mean, it never hurts to get your name out there more and right. become established. Absolutely, but it's true. not like you're driving a sales. No, it's not. Or it something. doesn't directly impact my day to day financials in any way, really. Mm -hmm. So why why the hell are you here? It's it's really just it's very interesting and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's uh, why I started. It's yeah. a lot of fun. And I mean, I think I think especially adding the second show has taught me a lot about myself. It's taught me a lot about what, the network, how things work here. Um, oh, really? And it's brought up a lot of things that. I haven't yet had time to come back to, but it's made wow, me think about there's like a lot to unpack there. there's a lot to unpack there. You know, it makes me think about like what what's the best ways to improve you know Linux Unplugged. Yeah. Uh, what other what other ways could I contribute to the network or fill in in other you know other avenues? Okay, we got to stop. So okay, yeah. so so what has it taught you about yourself? Doing TechSnap, the, doing Linux Unplugged for like a year and change didn't teach you. Well, I think it was just having you know there's a big perspective now. I'm I'm running the show, making things happen, and was that more of a shift than you expected? Yeah, you know, it, I think so. I expected a shift. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, didn't end the world. Things kept rolling. The, the show happens, um, but there's a lot more. I mean, to your credit, I think you know you've done an amazing job on Linux Unplugged. You, I mean, you're you know you're a professional at this point. You've been doing it for a long time. You run the network, uh, so you, a show just kind of happens. And I'd like to think that I help. But you know, if if I get hit on the freeway and I don't make it up here, the show's still going to go out. Uh, TechSnap, I mean, you might fill in if I didn't, but TechSnap's not the same way, and right. there's a lot of... It wouldn't be the same show anymore. Right, and Dan was new to this, too, when we started, so there, it's, there's a lot of learning, and and because, you know, it was TechSnap TNG, we're keeping a lot of the same things, but it, it I feel like it may be in a way, like, similar to when you ended last, you know, brought up a lot of, like, what what do we want this show to be right. about? What what element should we be highlighted? Where do we want to be different, and yeah. Yeah, what do we want to focus on, what are our strengths? Exactly. Yeah, that is a, really a lot to think about. It really is a lot to think about. So, uh, but it's it's more than that too. It's like you had to fit in another show into your schedule too. That's also that's also part of it. So one thing I'm interested in, especially like I had a lot of fun at um, Linux Fest yeah. this year. And so one angle I'm really interested in is you know I'm, I'm hoping this barbecue goes well. I'd really like to engage more with our with our community. Um, with other people, get more people involved. It's a totally different thing when you do it in person. Yeah, it really is. And I've is. said it a million times on the air, but it it just can't be... One of the people, uh, and he knows who he is, I won't say his name, because he's a great guy and I really like him. Uh, he was a pretty big troll of mine online. He just gave me shit all the time. And then things changed and we met in person. And then fast forward a little while later and like he's letting me borrow his Cadillac. Wow. We're hanging out while I'm in California. Like... Like, I consider him a friend. Like, if he ever needed mm -hmm. something, like, I would try to do my best. Like, it, you know, when you go from online where somebody's trolling me and attacking me, and then you meet them in person, and it transitions to a genuine friendship where, like, when I'm in that area again, I'm I'm hitting that guy up, and we're wow. talking, and we'll say, hey, if you want to hang out. Like, yeah. So, it, I agree. Like, this barbecue and going to Linux Fest Northwest, it... Uh, you realize how cool the people are that the, we, they're it, listening to these it, shows? Exactly. There's a lot of neat people. I think we, you know... it. It's so rare 
to find people in real life who might, you know, share our kind of niche exactly. interests. And so to be able to have this whole network of people who are already in that mindset, it's amazing. Yeah, they know what a package is. It, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they know what a distribution is. And so th- there is this shared language that you don't generally get to have with the average public, even people who might be technical. If they're not mm-hmm. if they're not Linux people, you don't have the shared language. So you do your Microsoft updates this week. Yeah. Yeah. How about that <laughs> new watch OS update? Siri's going to be on the watch face. Yeah. Isn't that... Uh, you know, high Sierra is looking good. Right. But with these people, like you could just you could roll into a conversation like, so, hey, flat packs, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we that already is, have stuff to talk about. Yeah, it's so much it's so much more so much more rewarding. But so it's personally gratifying. Uh, but it still seems like most people that uh, to stick with it after a long time, it needs to be more than just personally gratifying. It needs to be driving some other element of maybe their business. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about like Wes Incorporated just being? Uh, yeah, it's definitely on the back of my mind, um, especially with what we talked about earlier. You know, desires to to be able to work more remotely, be more flexible. Um, I do think I have a lot of skills that I could apply in that in that kind of trade. Maybe sometime soon the time will be right to con- to consider that more. Yeah. And there's also a lot of things, you know, I think this this has been a good opportunity to, I, I've always been interested in Linux and security and, and all of these angles. And I think this, it provides a good mirror to be like, all right, well, what are these things really are you interested in? And which ones, you know, where can you take it more? What mm. new opportunities yeah. can you explore there? I think, too, it's it's interesting how on top of topics that are relevant to your industry, you have to stay yeah. on, right? I, you, I think it challenges you in that it way. It really does because you you have to be more aware of community developments, project directions, news, and overall market and community sentiment than you would if you were just just doing a job like but when you're a commentator on it and you're watching it weekly and by therefore daily to do a weekly show right you really start to develop a, a, a an understanding and a following of the industry that i think is unique and it does give you a certain strength but it's not like something that you can really put on a pros or cons list no no it doesn't it doesn't really come up that way but it just it works itself into your day-to-day lifestyle yeah. like you're talking and now about all of a sudden that. you're that guy at work that's always up to date on all of these developments have you heard about that yeah yeah oh yeah yeah oh, no yeah i've been talking about i've been talking about that for months yeah yes. and i'm, I'm, I'm pretty you have to like gate that. yourself a little bit like yeah. okay wait not everyone doesn't read this all the time yeah. constantly yeah <laughs> and then it, then you start to realize like how long it takes certain topics to bubble up into the general public's purview versus how long you've been tracking it for the shows and i i, I think all of of that plays well into making a more informed uh, employee. So it, it does benefit work, but it's sort of a roundabout way. The other thing it's really making me think about is is what you know. Like I said, I didn't I didn't I didn't start doing it for the contracting reason or for the trying to sell myself reason or, or any of those things. Um, but it does really make me think. And more so recent, like how do I want to interact with the world? How do I what do I want my interface to be? Um, so I think I'd like to have. I'd like, to, I'd like to have more of that because I've really enjoyed some of the relationships that have grown from the shows. And I think I would like to complement that with some sort of longer form, maybe written content that mm. I could kind of, you know, abridge that with. Interesting. I think blogging is a totally underutilized medium for this network because we're so busy producing right. audio or video content that written content, it doesn't really, there's just no time for it. Mm-hmm. But it's such a great medium. And I think it would help you know, help solidify some of the things that we want to talk about in the show oh, yeah. or reference. Because then when you sit down to do the show, you when you work through the writing process, you really have to think things exactly. through to write it out. And then when you sit down to talk about it, you've really got a pretty good head around what, what it is you want to talk about. And I think it can add some flavor, too, because there's a lot of times like I'll do a setup or talk about something that I've been working on and you know, I can share it on the show and we can talk about it and users, people can ask questions, but it doesn't, it's not the same as me writing a detailed post about like, here's what I did, here's how it's working, and oh, it's on my GitHub. Yeah, that's that's the level I'd like to get to because it seems like that would be a lot, be a lot more transparent or honest or I don't yeah. even know if those are the right words. But yeah, it's interesting. That's a that's a that's a good way to think about it. It is. It's sort of like understanding the bigger picture of Wes. How do we take JB Ops to the next level? What do you mean by ops? Like day to day operations, mm. um, the the tech mm. side of things. Hmm. Mm. You know what I've been wondering? How do we make it more stable, more I've been production? wondering sometimes if I need an assistant. Yeah. Somebody who could not only take care of the day-to-day stuff, but also keep projects spinning so I can come back to them. Mm-hmm. Um, because often what happens is I have the idea, I have the goal, but I don't always have the means. Like I'm working on one right now, but I've been working on it all week long, and I just kind of work it, work it, work it, and there's little things that... You, you only know. have so much time and, you know. That's kind of what it comes down bandwidth. to. And concurrency, right? Like you can only, 
None of us can switch tasks every 10 seconds. But I'm, and do... Yeah, that's what it is. Is and I, So I want to come back to that for a second. But what just to finish my, past, my last thought is I, I, I wanted, if I did something like that, I'd want to do it in a way where I really still got good amount of exposure to whatever it is I'm talking about. So that's the line I'm trying to walk there. However, to your second point, uh, I have recently felt like my entire day in the afternoon, by the time the afternoon rolls around, really by, by 11 or noon, it's all in Telegram. I feel like I spend my entire yeah. day in Telegram now talking to audience members, talking to uh, people at JB, reaching out to guests. Like, it's either Telegram or Twitter, and I hate it. And so we need a talk. social media manager. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what I need. I f- Part of me is actually embracing it. So what I've been doing is I've been waking up earlier since it, the sun starts coming out, like, at 4.30 a.m. I wake up earlier, and I start working earlier. So that way I get all of my really uh, – Focus required super intensive work done. I try to get it done by about 10, 30, 11. So that way after I eat and I'm kind of low energy anyways, I can start doing things like responding to emails, Twitters, and Telegram. So I'm, I'm, I'm slowly restructuring my day around the problem and I'm finding it to work pretty well. But once the winter comes, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. Yeah. I've had to do some of that myself. It's like you can't, you just can't have that many interruptions and get yeah. any meaningful work done. Uh-uh. No, especially when it's like stuff that is, I have five or 10 things in my head that I'm translating into an action or code. And or they're delicate, edit. right? Like it might be a really good idea for your next show Super content thing. Delicate. And if you forget about it, it's gone. Mm-hmm. It's really easy. What, what, what happens to me all the time is I go to capture an idea on my phone but I unlock it and, and it, then op- it's, uh, it opens up a notification or yeah. telegram or goes it right directly into a chat and I'm in a chat all of a sudden and it's something that is actually pretty urgent and it requires a response and now all of my all of my focus and energy is on that and then I close the chat and I literally go now why did I get on my phone what was I what was I doing <laughs> That's and it's gone yep Do you have these problems beard? Mm, no. <laughs> Because I'm finding that, like, I might, I might even, at least at, at work, like, I might start doing, you know, like, almost a Pomodoro type thing. Yeah. But just for, like, no, I'm not going to respond to things yeah. until yeah. this 20 minutes is up. And then, yeah. okay, maybe. I am, I have been, without telling anybody, because I'm just practicing it, I have been practicing a two-hour no That seems like a good, yeah. No phone. No phone for the first two hours of my day. That, I like that a lot. Yeah, so far it's been hit and miss, but yeah, sometimes I can't resist. But I find the same thing, like either either staying up later, which is harder because you're already tired, or waking yep. up earlier, like just yep. to find time where other people aren't also there. Mm-hmm. I this is I honestly I honestly fantasize sometimes about not living a life like this. Like I think about it so much. Like, <laughs> and this is one of the reasons I'm into home automation is I'm trying to come up with ways to like automate, mm. do not disturb. Like I walk into this studio and I want my phone to silence sure. automatically. I just. Yep. Because what happened this morning, Beard can attest, is I got here early this morning to do an interview. I got here really mm, early. Right. I got here before anybody else, any other reasonable human is awake. And so I didn't get any notifications. And so I'm here putzing along in the studio, setting up shots, getting the lights, getting the camera all set. And I'm not thinking about notifications because I've been tooling away for 45 minutes and nobody You're else is zone. awake. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes before my interview starts, my ding, 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 ding. it just uh. starts going crazy. It just starts going. And I, and I realized, oh, yeah, I never sent this to D&D because... You weren't reminded to. I have not gotten a message yet because I've been up really early. And what I want, what I realize at that moment is when I'm in this room, what I want is shut everything down. Just shut it down. Just don't message me. Don't tell me about anything. And so we'll see. I'm working towards that. I'm looking at things like Home Assistant and whatnot Mm -hmm. to try to automate all of that. Maybe I'll get there one day. Maybe I won't. Your telegram has convinced me that humanity as a whole has some kind of sixth sense to know when other people are busy. Oh, I know. And try to interrupt them because. Every time, like when you're, whenever you're preparing to do a show, even when it's a show that's not being done live and nobody knows what the time is, people choose that moment to telegram you. It is true. It is every. <laughs> yep. it, it it is, and I'm I'm not a I'm not necessarily a believer in a bigger power, but it is one of the things that's made me over the years stop and go, how is this so possible? Like this morning, it was a nobody knew about the interview. Nobody knows. It's not on the calendar. It's, it's secret. Nope. I, in fact, I really, except for Rika, I don't think I, I and Hadia, I hadn't told anybody because yeah. I just was trying to get it scheduled and just get it done. I was yeah. doing it super early. 
I didn't tell anybody. And, yeah. and somehow you, 10 minutes before the show or before the yeah. recording started, yeah. you got messages from what, 12 people? And the only wow. thing that makes me feel better <laughs> is that the other human beings have witnessed this. So people realize <laughs> it's, it's not, not just, just me making you. this. It's not me making uh. it up. It is the craziest phenomenon ever. And I, I work on, I work on, like, I, I work on my notifications frequently. This is a constant process for me. <laughs> this is something I, I really. That's really, the first two hours. That's why he doesn't yeah. have no. He doesn't want <laughs> notifications. He's sit tweaking the settings. <laughs> yeah, I'm really interested in seeing if there's like some uh, programmatic way to do some of the stuff that OBS does for us. Mm-hmm. Because OBS is great, right? Like no, not, no negative comments there. But it seems like a little bit more scriptability and you know programmability, especially for things where you know, like what if you could have it where you know it's sitting there. I don't, maybe you can already do this, but you know, like it, you could have it on the droplet sitting there, and then anytime signal drops from here, it just switches to standby, yeah, right? Man. All the time, yeah, all, automatically. Great. I know Beard and I have fantasized a lot about JBot integration. Oh, yeah. now that would be slick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, JBot right now stops and starts remote droplets and mm-hmm. uh, stops and starts shows, but it'd be great. I was thinking recently if when we did start show in the chat room, if it started the recording in OBS. Yeah. Beard, how impossible is that? <laughs> uh, it's not impossible, but to do it, we need an admin interface so we can have, you know, the the API keys for all the different crap. And an admin interface to JBot? Uh, yeah, basically on the website of JBot, you would have an admin interface you log into using probably some kind of... Like GitHub Connect or something? Yeah, but nobody has stepped up to do that, and I don't have the time to do that, mm-hmm. so it's kind mm-hmm. of just been sitting there. Do you think, though, I, I, it seems to me that one of the things that when it goes, when it's going well that you've enjoyed is working with the community who's developing software. Yeah. Like, it, that seems like it's maybe more rewarding work than the editing. Yeah. Um, like with Caster Soundboard. and It's nice because I get to be the idea person rather than the implementation person. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. You <laughs> Which can stroke is, the uh, beard and create master plans. Yeah. And, and. These magical people figure out how to do this stuff, and it comes out amazingly. Even today, they're still working. Even today, you should see the the amount of code that's been done on the uh, the Python audio visualizer. Oh, really? Like there's the one we use to create the visualizer for this show. Yeah, there's like there's been like literally hundreds of commits in the past couple of weeks. That's awesome. So what are we what are we going to be seeing? Do you think? Well, completely redesigned GUI with a lot more uh, of the FMPEG functionality exposed, a Ooh. whole component interface with uh, saveable and loadable presets. Oh, yes. Wow. And yes. For various shows. Um, oh, yes. You can also save, like, the presets for specific components. Um, they're starting to work on the idea of adding the, the Project M stuff, which is the uh, the visualizer that uh, oh, you talked about uses. It last episode, I think, no or a couple way. episodes ago. Really, it's actually working. They're actually yeah. starting to think about it. Yeah, they have to figure out how to write the uh, the Python bindings for the C stuff. But hmm. it's coming uh, along. That's awesome. And then the the soundboard has been taken along. It's it's slowed down a little bit, but it's still got plenty of stuff that's coming down the pipe. Really, the only one that is kind of sort of dead in the water is JBot, which I find the most interesting of them all. That it's is kind funny. of sad. <laughs> it's because we probably talk about it the least now, but it is so well, integrated to what we do. And it's been here for a long time. It, it's now. weird, too, because it's also the one that the majority of the audience has the most interaction with. Well, and it's also the one out of all of our projects so far that's gotten adopted by other podcast communities. Yeah. Although I imagine that will change given what we just said about the other Caster two tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatnot. Yeah, so JBot, where, is that on the Jupyter Broadcasting GitHub, or is that, that's on yours? Is that's it? on mine. So it's github.com slash rekai? Yeah, slash showbot. Showbot. Showbot, I see. And that's in Ruby? Yep. Yeah, that would be, so there's so many things we could do with that, like like talking to OBS, mm-hmm. uh, setting up admin interfaces to work all that stuff out, but there's lots of... Maybe. Oh, man, we tie Alexa, cancel into into it is what you could like start the show exactly, that way exactly yeah then you're getting seriously high tech it's podcasting like never before the next generation and never again when we decide it's way too complicated and it wasn't worth it <laughs>